I'm better looking in person. Welcome to Virtual Book Signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg, and as always, we're here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. Memorial Weekend, as I mentioned, and uh, here we're going to talk about treachery and hatred. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, it's uh, we'll try to uh, expiate that on Monday uh, from our consciousness for a while. Uh, we're going to show uh, artifacts, as we always do. We've heard from many of you that you like the artifacts that we show that are relevant to each particular book. Uh, and they are, by the way, available for sale. They're part of our stock in the antiquarian side of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. So you can always go on the website and you'll probably find these. I think we're going to try to start to put them up uh, on virtual book signing as well so you can see there are links to get to them. So let's get to our authors because I have tons of questions and they have more than tons of answers, I fear. Uh, so. John Barr is with us, professor of history at Lone Star College in Kingwood, Texas. And uh, today's book is his Loathing Lincoln, an American tradition from the Civil War to the present. It's a Louisiana State University press book, 471 pages, and it's $35.95. It's the winner of the Jules and Francis Landry Award for 2014 and part of the series called Conflicting Worlds, New Dimensions of the American Civil War, edited by uh, Mike Parrish, a good friend of ours. Uh, I noticed there were no illustrations in here, so I'm wondering if they were just too gruesome, the hatred against Lincoln. Um, William Barr, liberal arts research professor of, in US history at Pennsylvania State University, director of the Richards Civil War Era Center, and editor of the Journal of the Civil War. Today's book is with malice towards some uh, and uh, treason and loyalty in the Civil War era. It's the University of North Carolina Press. They've been very loyal to us and we appreciate your sending your authors to us always. 419 pages as $40. It's part of a series as well called The Little Field History of the Civil War Era. The editors are Gary Gallagher and Michael Parrish again. Also no illustrations by the way I noticed. Um, that's okay. We'll, we'll try to add some here. Um, I guess I'm really going to uh, start out by asking each of you how you got to this book and why now, for instance. Uh, I was looking, by the way, at, uh, at I'm bringing an artifact out immediately uh, because I want to. Uh, it's called The New Gospel of Peace by a man named Richard Benjamin. He had many, many pamphlets that came out during the war. Uh, and this is a satire in biblical form on the political scene of 1861 to 62. And uh, well, excuse me, not this one. The, his first book was that, called The Book of Prophet Stephen, Son of Douglas, wherein marvelous things are foretold of the reign of Abraham. In this new gospel of peace, he continues on talking about the, uh, about the Lincoln administration and the army and what he did not like about any of it. So how did you get to uh, this particular book at this particular time? Because it's, and what sort of material is there out there for you to use in the anti-Lincoln tradition? Are we starting with me? Please. Okay. Uh, well, I suppose for me there were indirect influences and then direct influences. And indirect influences would uh, be my parents, I think. Uh, my dad was from Crown Point, Indiana, which is not uh, far from here at all. And I've been seeing the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop uh, catalog for quite a long time because of my dad. And then I grew up uh, in near Lexington, Kentucky, in Richmond, Kentucky, and uh, Kentucky being a border state and kind of a state that you could say seceded after the war, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was probably an indirect influence. Uh, and then my graduate work, my advisor at the University of Houston was Eric Walder, who's done uh, work on uh, the fire eaters and I think uh, Eric uh, that was an influence as well uh, because he had uh, was familiar with uh, people that had led the country or led the the Confederacy out of the country so uh, and then also too I attended a Lincoln forum I think it was around 2000 and the second speaker I heard speak there was Lerone Bennett Jr. Mm -hmm. wow. and he was a really uh, very, talk about he was, in a right, very good speaker and so I thought you know this is a, it was just one of those things that percolated in the back of my mind this mm -hmm. is very interesting and 
so I think those were the main reasons. So the Rhone uh, is part of the uh, Anton Lincoln story. We'll get to that sure. in, in a bit, but was actually an influence to get this book out. Yeah, I think so. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, Bill, the same thing. Okay. Uh, how did you get to this? Start uh, out. Actually, my journey didn't begin with Lincoln. It began in a graduate seminar about 20-some years ago when the instructor said that she thought it would have turned out, the war would have turned out better if afterward we had lined up all the planners against the wall and executed them. Um, and, of course, it was a provocative statement. But it was one that always stuck with me because I started to wonder, why didn't we do that? Why didn't? any rebels hang for treason, when in fact they did commit treason. Um, at least I thought you could interpret it that way. Uh, and the journey that I then had to follow was I had to understand how did the northern public um, understand treason, and how did they use it and employ it. And I kept finding surprises along the way. I, I found out that it was really popular notions of treason, not the courts, not the legal community, but just how people felt about treason that motivated a lot of policy making, both high and low. And um, it allowed for certain things that, as you say, were critics of the Lincoln administration could actually call him a dictator, which I don't believe, by the way. Um, he left uh, too much of a paper trail that suggests otherwise, that he could not suppress all newspapers. But nonetheless, he suppressed newspapers. Uh, the Union closed churches. Uh, they arrested. Um, preachers who would not say the prayer to the president, and uh, well, I just found that all very interesting and exciting. Mm -hmm. and that so a wonderful book came out. Both of these mm -hmm. are terrific works that have not been explored as you two have, and together especially, they really uh, meld into one, and I, I think one has to read both books almost together uh, to get a complete uh, aspect of what the treason was, because they, they didn't especially care for Lincoln, I bet. Uh, as well. So you're interested in the social and political consequences mm -hmm. of ideology, as you mentioned. Right. And uh, what I saw was how Lincoln, in many respects, was reacting to situations that were happening out on the ground rather than creating uh, these situations. I think Lincoln profoundly was interested in one thing, winning the war. Uh, he wasn't interested in trampling on civil liberties. He wasn't looking to, uh, at first, emancipate, uh, but he was looking for how can I win uh, this conflict. So what was really driving a lot of the uh, handling of treason in, on the countryside and arrests that were going on in the border states and so on was not even coming from Washington at all, but it was coming from within communities. And so what you see very often is Lincoln actually having to step in later and clean up some messes uh, along the way. Well, how, uh, you know, he didn't micromanage, you say, but at the same time he had a number of these things come before him. I've seen it in autographs that have come by the shop as well. Sure. So, uh, but without micromanaging, how much, what percent came up to him of all the alleged treason that came in the, uh, during the war? How much of it really, what percent would you say came to before his eyes? You know, I never thought about it in terms of percentage, but I would um, probably place it at no more than a quarter of all of the stuff ever made it up into his realm. Uh, many of the things happened came up, were handled, and died uh, at the community level. And you see a number of egregious arrests and, and problems, uh, things that I point out in the book, that occur uh, without any real policy making from above or any real knowledge. So I'd say about three quarters of all that goes on is not being steered uh, by Washington. Well, you have at the end of the book three appendices that are fascinating. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that are listings of courts martial for treason, mm -hmm. courts martial for disloyalty, and the political arrest reported in the newspapers with the charges and the causes right. in there as well. What did you learn by compiling these? Certainly that speech accounted for much of it. That was, I think, for me the biggest shock, um, was how much speech was considered disloyal. In fact, if you really wanted to come right down and boil it to what did the northern public consider was disloyalty, it really wasn't what we think of in terms of um, uh, being treacherous to the Confederates or supplying guns or anything like that. In some of these cases, especially the courts marshals, 80 percent almost of the cases that got uh, people tried for disloyalty or before military commissions, excuse me, was for speech, was for criticizing the government, was for cheering for Jeff Davis or some other form of political expression. Well, certainly uh, when the uh, 
when the conspirators shot Lincoln. And uh, there was a lot of speech going around. Mm -hmm. And uh, here in Chicago, four people were shot dead uh, for saying that he deserved it, basically. Mm -hmm. And elsewhere, they were tarred and feathered. And right. In fact, one of the only pe persons hanged by the military for treason, so-called treason, during the Civil War was by Ben Butler in uh, New Orleans, a guy who tore down the U.S. flag. And that was enough to bring the army to your door. Tell me, uh, uh, John, what were the major charges that the loathers had against Lincoln? I love to use, I'm use that word. Uh, we're gonna, you don't get to use Lincoln loathers here in the Lincoln Lincoln bookshop very often. I'm going to take advantage of it for an hour. So, what were their charges against them, and 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 did that proceed differently over time? Oh, and absolutely. Uh, the 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 charges that were laid down in the Civil War era were really the charges that persisted uh, even down to the present day, and what charges that they lay against Lincoln kind of intersect with cultural worries in different eras of American history. Um, so, but for example, he was, uh, he and Seward were blamed for beginning the war at Fort Sumter, for being duplicitous in starting the war. Uh, they were blamed for, uh, that they didn't uh, fight the war to save the Union, they were fighting the war to save the Republican Party. Uh, the, uh, the suspension of habeas corpus, that was a, uh, a, big, a big issue for uh, the Lincoln Lothers. I'll go ahead and use that as well. Um, the, uh, the charge of Lincoln being a tyrant, that was a, a big one uh, also. And then, you know, the issue of, of race and the possibility that this might bring out, uh, or the possibility that this war might bring about uh, greater racial equality was something that worried uh, the, the loathers, uh, if you will. Uh, and then uh, election fraud in 1864, the violence of the war, uh, you know, you name it, almost every charge that was laid against him later was really kind of set down in those uh, four years between 1861 and 1865. Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah. Uh, just, did they ever talk about the way the Union military supervised and chilled elections uh, during that time? Well. I didn't, I didn't come across that, but I did come across it more with some of his critics later. Later, uh, okay. You know, uh, so that would be my answer. Yeah. 